Good morning, Los Angeles. How's everybody doing? Chris, thanks again, man. Pleasure, man. It's so awesome. Kind of, kind of crazy little gig, you know? <laughs> yeah. Dude, What's the quickest way to the lobby from here? Straight, Straight down that way. Thanks, man. It's a hell of a thing to have grown up geek. I had friends around me that were geeky. We played D&D &D and you know, we'd, we'd talk shop about comics and things like that. But, you know, my family was not geeky. My immediate, you know, my siblings, I didn't understand. Sweet, thank you very oh, much, good, sir. man. Well, good to meet you. What's your name? Eugene. Good to meet you, man. Nice What'd you, you think of that? It was awesome. It was great. Yeah, it was kind of kick-ass. Yeah, I love the way I like that. Being called the rise of geek culture yeah, yeah, yeah. as a lifelong card-carrying member of that group, I just kind of think everybody else is catching up. But what I do think is great about it is that whatever you're passionate about, you know, whether you're a Star Wars fan or a Star Trek fan or a World of Warcraft fan or a Marvel fan, whatever it is, I think what we've started to see is people celebrating things that they believe in and they're passionate about. Literally tears in my eyes. It felt <laughs> like it brought us back. I mean, the whole series. That's all I want to hear, man. It, yeah, especially the, amazing. even the Lord's of War thing. I'm just oh, geeked up. I can't wait. Yeah. Oh what was that? Yes. <laughs> we only rarely ever built games to please ourselves. I wanted to work on World of Warcraft because I, I wanted to play in a world like World of Warcraft. I knew from the age of about 14, this is what I wanted to do with my life. This was back in the day when it took one programmer and you could make a game by yourself. Think of games like Berserk or Asteroids. Really simple. That's kind of where I started. So while at UCLA working on a computer science degree, I knew that I wanted to start Blizzard the day that I graduated. I think our class was around 300 students, but there were maybe 10 of us that would finish our two-month projects in the first week and spend the next, you know, month and a half optimizing our code. And I took these guys and started to show them the vision I had. Instead of being sapped off to the Microsofts and the IBMs of the world, that we could try and do something, you know, a little different. Blizzard has been around for going on 24 years. When we started, a development team could be two and a half people. The experiences that we deliver to our players today require hundreds, arguably thousands of people. One of the things that Blizzard has always done so well over the years is take types of games that have previously appealed only to a narrow audience and make them accessible to a broader audience. They had done that with real-time strategy games. They had done that with action RPGs. And so that's really their particular genius, and they did that with World of Warcraft, taking a type of game that previously had only appealed to a really narrow audience and making it much broader. We dreamed about bringing Warcraft to life, so instead of being a top-down real-time strategy game, you would actually just be a character running around and, and battling and teaming up with your friends to fight increasingly difficult bad guys. That was sort of a dream that wasn't really in reach until, um, really until Origin came out with Ultima Online. I remember installing it on my work computer, expecting that I was just going to take a quick look at it. I ended up staying all night long playing Ultima Online and never left my office chair and never slept that night. EverQuest took Ultima Online and extended it to the next level. The game was that much more immersive. You could play it first person. I still contend to this day that for its time, EverQuest was the best game ever made. EverQuest became this massive inspiration for a lot of us. We loved the game. There were things about EverQuest, however, that were kind of hardcore. You couldn't help but play it and say, well, this could be improved or we could spin the content this way. It really, in me, reawakened the desire to make the next great game. 
at the time. I was on the project called Nomad, which was a third person, real time strategy RPG. It was everything, but we couldn't really develop it. It, was, it just was crap. There's a lot of passion and, and work, that blood and sweat that went into it, but it really didn't coalesce into something that people got or really got behind because um, there was no other game out there at the time that it was trying to, you know, be like. When we make something, we're going to plan how that works and how that looks. We're going to do a zone layout and we're going to be like, this is perfect, we love it. Then we start building the world and we make everything with that world, all the trees and the rocks and the buildings, and we build the whole world and we look at it and we hate it. And we're like, okay, this just didn't work. So we'll take all of it and we'll scrap it. We'll start over and build a completely different world. Uh, sometimes you need to do that. There were people on the team that were definitely hurt or disappointed that Nomad was not going to be anymore. But I think everyone understood we just weren't getting the traction we wanted with that game. And we were playing EverQuest Ultima Online and we thought, you know what, we could do that. Why don't we make one of these? This is awesome. I mean, why don't we make a game that we love? Ultimately, it was Alan Adham who stepped in and said, hey, we got to rethink the direction that we're going. We should be going, you know, more towards World of Warcraft and less towards this idea of Nomad. As we were working on World of Warcraft, I started archiving cool moments from the game. Here is an old map of Eastern Kingdoms. So it shows, you know, something up here called the Dragon Isles Raid, um, which was actually in production um, that doesn't exist. The, the players will also notice that when World of Warcraft first shipped, um, the game only went to a level cap of 60, and you'll see zones like Eastern Plaguelands here are going 60 to 70. Um, we had a zone called Airy Peaks, which later got renamed to Hinterlands. This is Stormwind, the first day that it ever existed in World of Warcraft. There's no statues around it. The road doesn't exist. And then later in this screenshot, you can see the statues were starting to get built by the art department. And when something comes into World of Warcraft, at first, if it doesn't have a texture on it, it shows up as completely green. So we had these giant green statues for some days sitting in Stormwind City. This was the moment that we placed Onyxia in the world. Um, later, we had some really great designers and artists work on this. As you, as you can see, Onyxia looks totally different in the screenshot than she does today in World of Warcraft. An artist named Roman Kenny would later come in and make that model look like the beautiful model it is today. Alex Afrasiabi and Chris Metzen were the primary drivers behind the story of things like Onyxia. When I got hired at Blizzard, the computer stuff always really was very intimidating to me. So um, I started writing, um, and uh, the, the boss kind of saw what I was doing and went, huh, you know, I think this kid has some potential. I've been working with Chris for a long time. You know, I mean, heck, you know, we were just college kids, got a job at Blizzard. Heck, next thing we know, we're getting paid to do art like crazy. I think that was one of the most exciting times about uh, Blizzard, right? Is a lot of kids coming together, throwing out ideas, not knowing the rules, and just not even know if we're taking a risk, but we were so naive and so hungry, it didn't matter. We'll just chase it. All the artists, you know, we played Warcraft 1 and Warcraft 2, but we had all these questions about the world. So we bugged Chris so much. And he broke out these acrylic paints. We looked at him and we're like, what are you painting? And he painted a map of Azeroth on the wall. And it was just his way of saying, guys, this is the map of the world. He just did it. The mythological underpinnings of that world, it wasn't just about bits and bytes and wireframes. It started with words and ideas and feelings and people. I never in a million years dreamed that we'd build the bones of a world in the hills and trees and rivers. I don't think anybody had any idea, really, how many people or how much time it was going to take to make World of Warcraft. People started to realize, okay, if we're really going to hit these goals, we're going to have to add more people. So the team started to grow. By the time I came on board, the team was about 60 people, which at the time seemed big, right? At the time, I was thinking, oh, 60 people, that's a really large team. I was coming from Ultima Online, where we had about a 30-person team. We realized our estimate of doing 500 quests just isn't going to cut it. We're going to have to do like five times that for this game to be awesome. We wanted to get everything into the game. There were many nights where many of us would be here 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. The longest we'd ever taken on a game was Warcraft 3, which I want to say was three years. 
The World of Warcraft took about five years by the time it went out the door. The weeks and months were going by like they were hours. I remember at the time, it seemed impossible that we would actually be able to launch the game in a state that felt complete by the end of 2004. The 11th hour before the game shipped, we were getting in massive pieces of content like the Onyxia raid. We made Molten Core in one week. And the whole time, as we were even delivering on, on those pieces of content, we're thinking, this isn't enough, this isn't enough. So it was a really sort of terrifying experience. We were tired. People were kind of beat up. It had been a long, long stretch of highway. But we were playing it, and we were testing it, and we were looking at each other in the eye going, it's super fun. We're super in. No one knew what it was going to do, but there was there was a sense that this is really fun. Hopefully, people are really going to like it. Hopefully, we'll sell a few. <laughs> At the time World of Warcraft came out, the Lord of the Rings movies had also just come out and had really taken the first big step in bringing fantasy back into the cultural mainstream. You also had the Harry Potter movies also starting around the same time. So the cultural time was right for this kind of product to come along. It was announced that we would do a developer signing at Fry's. One of our producers called us and said, you guys aren't going to believe what's going on here. We got off the freeway, and there were police everywhere. There were crowds of people walking down the street. It looked like Mardi Gras. And then I thought, did we somehow mistakenly do this on the same night that someone was having a big event? And as we got closer and kind of turned the corner, I realized, no, actually, this is our thing. What do you mean they're here for us? Like, I thought a couple people would show up to get their boxes signed, not 6,000 or whatever crazy number that showed up. Some people literally didn't know what was in the box. You know, it was just sort of a leap of faith of, you know, hey, I've played Blizzard games before, Warcraft was great, Starcraft was great, and this game's gonna be awesome, so I just wanna meet the people who are here. It was the most amazing experience. As a passionate Blizzard fan myself, I feel like I saw a lot of myself in the audience, right? I, I saw, you know, a community of gamers that was very much like the group of developers that were, were sitting on the opposite side of the table. We were there till four or five or six in the morning signing every single box that came through. And that was the easy part. One of the things they felt really, really strongly about was not to sell more boxes of the game than we could support on our servers that we had at the time, because they didn't want people to have a bad experience where the servers were bogged down and you couldn't log in. And it turns out all of those boxes that we had projected to last for a couple of months sold out within a day or two. We had planned to have a million users within the first 12 months of the game. We had those first million users within like three or four months. So all of the equipment and servers that we had planned to deploy, we had meticulously planned every month we're going to deploy this many and this many. We basically deployed them all. We just said, put them all up in the first two, three months. Day one, we were actually shouting for correct numbers because the numbers that were coming in were so large that we thought that they were incorrect numbers and that the monitoring that we had in place was bogus. There was actually a time before WoW launched that we thought that we could probably get away with supporting World of Warcraft with 12 to 20 uh, employees total. And uh, we were a little bit off the mark there. <laughs> we went from a company of like 500 people to, you know, at one point we were over 5,000 people um, because of World of Warcraft. When I first came on to WoW, WoW had shipped about six months before that. There was this buzz and this energy and excitement and trepidation as well. It was like, okay, now, now, we could, now, what, now what do we do? It was truly amazing is how big a success it became. I think that caught everyone off guard. I mean, we all thought, okay, you know, it, hey, this thing could get a million players here. You know, I mean, this, this is really special. But when it went up to five, six, eight, nine, ten million worldwide, it was just just unbelievable. We live at a really interesting crossroads right now where, where the games industry has grown so fast and so huge. But uh, Warcraft, I think, is the daddy of them all. Come on, we have to finish the quest in Stonehaven. Stan? Stan? Hang on, guys, my dad wants something. Stan! What? You've been on your computer all weekend. Shouldn't you go out and socialize with your friends? I am socializing, Artard. I'm logged on to an MMORPG with people from all over the world and getting XP with my party using TeamSpeak. 
I'm not a artard. This role-playing game out in 2004 returns to the world of Azeroth, where heroes like Leroy Jenkins do battle. Let's are... do this, Leroy Jenkins! Oh my god, he just ran in. You could actually say that the Leroy Jenkins situation was one of the first great internet memes of any kind, and actually became a verb. Leroy means to rush headlong into a situation of extreme danger with no regard to the potential consequences. Stick to the plane. Oh gee, Leroy, you were just stupid as hell. At least I have chicken. Once you start hitting in the pop culture and for it to resonate with this many people, that's where you can say, wow, we've done something pretty amazing here. I chose to race Orc. And I chose them because uh, they're big and strong. Dwarves, all about, you know, the power. Just, just go straight for it. Rogue Blood Elf. Because first of all, it's Horde, and I relate more to being a misfit who's misunderstood. Paladin was kind of the guy who was a lot of times saving the day, fighting for the god and country. I can relate to that. I've always wanted to live in this fantasy world. I've always wanted to be a hero, a bit warrior, because just want to wield a big sword and be the guy leading the charge. I love gnomes. I think they're the uh, technological core of the Alliance. I had a bunch of friends and they were all nervous. They said, we need someone to take access to the face. I said, what the hell, man? I'll do it. That's who I am. Why else would you be anything but orc? They're beautiful. Being a warrior is about just fighting with everything that you have. It's not World of Peace craft. It's World of Warcraft, baby. I played a human priest. She may just be a character, but she brought me out of my shell. I was like, okay, what is the least amount of clothes I can wear in this game? So I obviously became a Blood F Paladin. The reason I picked Undead is because I wanted the ugliest race. I have a little 90s shaman, and its name is Dyslexic. I named it Dyslexic because uh, I myself am dyslexic, so dyslexic I have to wear two different colored shoes to tell my left and right. I've been playing human paladins since I was 12 years old. I don't see any reason to change that up now. Justice ain't gonna dispense itself. I've always been drawn to elves. There's something about elves that I just really like. And the blood elves in particular have this fascinating story because they're survivors. And when I started playing, I had just suffered a terrible accident. Every doctor that I met said that I should either be dead or paralyzed. So I had a neck brace on and I was banished to life in a couch. I started the game and I played a blood elf. And as I was questing, I found a lady's necklace. I had to return the necklace to Lady Sylvanas Windbreder. She's the leader of the undead. And she takes the necklace, she throws it down, and all of a sudden she starts singing. The more I got into her story, it changed my perspective. You see how much she suffered to get her body back. And for me, having lost my body, that was, that was a story that really, really resonated. It meant a lot to me. And her story helped me heal. There are so many players of our game who talk about it the same way they would speak of their favorite summer vacation with their family or meeting their significant other and their first date and their song that was playing on the radio when they realized they were falling in love. And that sort of thing happens in the game all the time. one of those moments, I think everybody had one of those moments like, oh, now we've made it, and that was BlizzCon. We put the announcement for BlizzCon into the World of Warcraft launcher, and it sold out within like a day. One of my favorite moments, BlizzCon had not opened yet, and there's just this sea of people at the Anaheim Convention Center waiting for the doors to open. I'm going up the, the escalator, and as I'm getting to the top, I just yell, for the horde, and the whole audience Lights up. For the heart, for the heart. You hear, for the alliance. For the alliance. Go for the And they just start, you know, raging on each other. How cool is that? It's overwhelming and humbling to us when we go to these events like BlizzCon. Doing it is as important for us as it is for the players, and it recharges all of the Blizzard team members' geek batteries seeing all of these people here just to see World of Warcraft and realizing this is something special. Late auction houses in every major city. This is these people's lives. I mean, they have, some of these people came from all over the country, all over the world to come together to meet some of these players that they've met in the game. 
It was just a blast. And we've been doing it almost every year since. You do have a fan base that is not only uh, dedicated to this world, but they're passionate about it, they're opinionated about it. Falstad Wildhammer was going to be on the Council of Three Hammers, but it's not in the game at all. What happened to him? Isn't Falstad dead? From uh, Day of the Dragon? He survived, and in fact, he was the leader of Airy Peak and Vanilla WoW through Wrath of the Lich King. Right, of course. Right. Yeah, Alex, what's up with that? <laughs> thanks, thanks for pointing that out. We're going to get that fixed. Thank you. Bet. Blizzard has taken the time to really speak to their players. They have people on the ground. I get feedback from hundreds of players who are oftentimes in, who are in my guild and say, hey, this doesn't work here. Oh, if you go to this section here, and we're pretty sure that's in, you know, invaluable for Blizzard because we're able to say, hey, you know, as a unified front, this is great, this needs some work. WoW fans don't mess around. I mean, they take World of Warcraft seriously. We always say there's kind of two main characters of World of Warcraft. There's the player and the world. WoW just has that loving community that it's always there to support you, always there to help. The one thing that keeps me playing and keeps me coming back would have to be the people that I've met there. It's just an awesome place to belong. My youngest son was diagnosed with leukemia and the community helped us get through it, so thank you. My mom's actually handicapped. She has MS. It was a really awesome way for my mom to feel like she could get out and really experience the world. As a veteran, for myself, it gives me a second home. Uh, I've made tons of friends in the game. I've made many different friends, <laughs> speaking yeah. of which. What's up, dude? How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm I know you're on here. I'm in costume. You know the South, you know the South Park episode of World of Warcraft? I'm the, yeah. The most meaningful relationship that I've developed thanks to World of Warcraft has got to be my marriage. One thing led to another. A couple years later, we're married with two children. Meeting my boyfriend, Jackson, or Bajira. All muscle and metal, baby. <laughs> you guys provided a medium for us to meet when we were states away. She server transferred IRL so that we could uh, work on establishing a garrison together. My wife is somebody that I met in World of Warcraft. We started to play together more and more often, and uh, you know, eventually we started dating, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> it's the community, it's the people that I play with. We have so much fun. These people have become my family. I've never seen, I've never seen a game be this powerful. It's funny, you don't realize your limitations when you don't know. <laughs> And that was really one of those moments where I just had no idea what I was getting myself into. The opening of the Gates of Ankaraj was really a huge moment in Warcraft history. It's interesting because it isn't one that we've really repeated, yet it has such great kind of historic value. We wanted to capture a lot of what we had seen in EverQuest or Ultima Online with these major events where one person on the server could be you know, the hero for a day. The whole server would come together, or would have to come together, to unlock this dungeon in this raid. The door was this crazy door that twisted and rotated, and these roots would kind of untangle and it would open. And I had a sense where I said, this is only ever going to happen one time, ever, per server. And I thought, that was pretty damn cool. We just didn't realize how many people would actually show up to this thing. I expected people to show up. I didn't expect everyone to show up. It turns out that you should totally be talking to your server engineers when you have a plan like this. Focusing all of that in one area turned out to be not a good idea, um, especially all at once, because uh, at that point we had CPUs max, we had databases max out. It is an event that actually a lot of players kind of look back to and say, this was really, really cool, but it's actually, it was very, very stupid. <laughs> Every single server converged upon Silithus, which is the zone that Ankaraj was in, and proceeded to basically repeatedly crash the entire world server 
over and over and over again until people just said, I can't even remain awake anymore, I gotta go. And when finally it came down below enough of a threshold, they were able to actually open it. But it was something that we ended up learning from uh, and actively avoid going forward. This is one of our US data centers. We have 17 worldwide, and this is where we host World of Warcraft. All of the data for your characters, the world that you interact in, is all contained in the data centers. We usually push 100 gigabits per second. We would be able to download four HD movies per second. There is a high level of security. Whether it's malicious or accidental, we want to make sure that people stay outside of our areas. This is actually the first time that we've actually allowed cameras into our cages. So this is what one of the blades looked like for World of Warcraft. So this particular one is Tychondrius, one of our more popular realms. It's the CPU, it's the memory, it's essentially what creates the world and sends it back out. There's tens of thousands of these worldwide. All of these are designed so that the developers can take advantage of the game. They have the world servers, they have instant servers, um, and those make up realms. This is what we call the GNOC, or the Global Network Operations Center. It's essentially where we monitor the heartbeat worldwide of all of our games. This one in particular is seeking a look at various security threats worldwide. Every once in a while you'll see this light up significantly, which is a pretty large attack. The screen that we're looking at here shows all of the logins worldwide for the various games that we have. Each pop that you see on the screen is somebody logging in to play the game. And then these two screens, we are monitoring uh, streaming feeds. It's an early indication if we ever have any problems from the player's point of view. We push the boundaries of the technology as far as we can. We try not to tell the developers no unless physics gets in the way. You know, so far to date, we can only push light so fast and we kind of have to say no at that point, but otherwise we try and figure out a way that we can make the vision come to life. After we had launched the service in 2004, we kind of were in panic catch-up mode. We were in a very reactive mode where we were patching. We knew we wanted to deliver cool content to players, but we couldn't seem to get our feet beneath us. We spent you know, all of our time really just trying to get things under control, and I would really say it was about nine to 12 months after launch before we were like, I guess we should make an expansion for this game. <laughs> World of Warcraft experienced such explosive growth in its first year and two years, and the real question was, could Blizzard sustain their momentum? Would the first expansion, Burning Crusade, really be able to live up to the level of quality that they had established in Vanilla WoW? Where do we go next? Warcraft had always been in the, in the interactive space of video games, kind of compared to you know, Tolkien or other, other fantasy settings you know, that we had all grown up you know, playing games within, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, things like that. And uh, man, I had a... <clears throat> I had a fire in my gut, desperately wanting to prove that we were not old hat, that we were not the same old thing, that our world could stand up and take you to places that you, know, you would not expect. We developed this story whereby the player walks through this ancient portal and is transported into this broken, shattered world. It was definitely not the same old thing. Um, and it was funny at the time, you know, kind of walking the team through this idea. Um, especially the artists, and they're all just going, what? What the hell, you know? The guys at Blizzard were so awesome to archive a lot of this for me, so now it's not all bent up in a drawer. Here are some images that were sort of the firsts. This is a uh, picture of a paladin I had drawn uh, for some friend's card game that never got used, and we ended up using this in Warcraft as our paladin Uther. Notice his eyes are covered, he's blind, but he's carrying the Book of Honor and Virtue. Well, we didn't want a blind paladin because he's supposed to run around with a Warhammer, right? So we took the mask off of the paladin, and what I did was I put it on this character here, who was my inspiration for Illidan. And this was the very first Illidan picture that was done back in 2000. He had carved out his eyes to have the demonics, you know, sense the demons. He used demonic energy against the demons. This was back when Illidan was somewhat of a good guy. You are not 
Prepare. Of course, Burning Crusade was a huge success, and they really were able to not only maintain the level of quality they had established in Vanilla WoW, but even raise the bar. I look back on that first expansion, I believe it did exactly what I hoped it would do. It just sucked people in the teeth and reset their expectations. I think our players began to understand that we weren't in this just to sleepwalk through, you know, some kind of classic plain rap fantasy thing, that we were definitely looking at it like artists and challenging ourselves and them to kind of take this journey where anything was possible. In the years around Burning Crusade, this is when you really started to see the adoption in Asia and in Europe that made World of Warcraft not just an American phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. The beautiful thing about a game like World of Warcraft is that it crosses cultures very well. In China, for example, internet cafes are so popular. It's always been a one-child policy. Kids, they don't, they don't have siblings. So then they need to go to a place where they can get that social interaction. It's, it's an experience. You sit down and you play games with your friends and everybody's, you know, screaming and playing. It's really a social experience. I'm not sure that we necessarily realized we would have the global reach that we ended up with. When we released the game in Europe, we created the a market that people said didn't exist because it blew up 10 times. I really like hardcore raiding. I played uh, Druid, didn't fit me, Paladin, perfect. I made a guild and I still, I'm still in contact with loads of them. There were loads of people from like across the UK and Europe. At the end of the day, the beauty of a game like World of Warcraft is that you are connecting everyone together, so you are kind of uh, diminishing, you know, the cultural differences between, between the different people. That became the fascinating lesson to us, was how similar players were, regardless of where they were globally. Um, once they were living in the world of Azeroth, they were just sort of citizens of Warcraft. The most memorable moment I've had playing World of Warcraft came when I was playing the No More Lock. I was headed into Ironforge for the very first time. The first time I ever went through the gates of Orgrimmar. I was walking up the path, guarded by dwarves on either side, entering this massive doorway that was carved into the side of a mountain. As soon as I walked through those gates and the drums kicked in and the music changed and I saw an entire city to explore, I knew I was hooked. The grand, it's just rolling hills and you can look off into the distance and then this giant elephant just walked right past me and it was the way they make it feel like a real world that is my favorite thing about World of Warcraft. Watching the sunrise, any sunrise, and the reason for that is something that we did differently. We have a real-time clock. We call it time is time. Time is part of a person's sense of immersion. It's subtle but important. In Northrend, there's an area where the Forsaken buildings are. It's in this kind of snowy, moody area, and the light is really, really nice at around 5 p.m. The only time you see a sunrise in World of Warcraft is if you're up during sunrise. So they're rare and unique and beautiful. My most memorable time playing this game had to have been in BC when I was a rogue and got server first dual warglaves. Those were good times. Man, it's good being a nerd, isn't it? We decided to have a hot tub party in one of the moon wells in Duskwood. The uh, moment at the Wrathgate where you pick up Olvar's shield. I almost shed a tear because uh, after picking up the shield and everybody else saluted, I go on the forums and I make a post saying, We are raiding Heroic Halion on Monday, October 11th. If you have work, call out sick. If you have plans, cancel them. And that night, we killed him. My god, the nerd screams were amazing. Probably my most memorable moment in game had to have been our first takedown of the Lich King. My son. The day you were born 
the very forests of Lordaeron whispered the name Arthas. Defeating Arthas, aka the Lich King. Arthas, I think. It's just legendary. To see him go down was like nothing I've experienced in a video game. I remember screaming and yelling with my friends on Skype so loud that the neighbors started banging on the walls. Finally getting him down was the kind of euphoric excitement and celebration that, I mean, it's, it's happened so rarely in my real life. Trying to figure out what the next thing for after Burning Crusade was going to be was, was an interesting process. We knew that we were going to fight the Lich King. We knew we wanted to make the Lich King a much more prominent figure in, uh, in our storytelling. We wanted to have two zones that players funneled into for Alliance and Horde, not uh, just the one go through the dark portal kind of moment. And then we wanted to have skiing. Um, we were going to have we're going to have all these snow, all the snow. We're going to have all these mountains skiing. That's going to be a feature. We still do not have skiing in World of Warcraft, but. Uh, that was an idea at one point. I think one of the things that Blizzard did in Wrath of the Lich King that they hadn't done before was really take their storytelling to another level, including in-game cinematics uh, like the Wrathgate sequence that really brought the players into the story in a way they hadn't before. Blizzard has actually been on the forefront of game cinematics pretty much as long as they've existed. Blizzard cinematics did inspire me greatly from my, my very, very uh, young child days, which they hate when I say that here because I'm about 13 years younger than most of the guys who were doing this at that time. So I was like, oh yeah, Warcraft 2? I love playing that when I was 13. And they just all go, ah! <laughs> Seeing the fan art and the way people respond to the game that we've created um, and how it inspires them towards their own creative outlets is is inspiring to us. I remember the first time after the game had been out for a few weeks or a few months, people were video capturing their footage while playing it and editing it together, creating movies that took the established storyline to the next level. And I think that was really interesting that this game, this entertainment experience turned into a, sort of a creative medium and an outlet for other people. The first Machinima experience that I saw online that totally took me by surprise was Return, done by Taron Gregory. Home. The sweet sound of that word had sustained me through battles beyond all counting. My friend Ezra comes to me one day and says, oh, by the way, have you seen that uh, Blizzard is putting on a movie contest for BlizzCon? I'm like, that sounds interesting. For 30 long years, war, endless war. And we created a six minute movie called Return, a Warcraft motion picture, and submitted it not thinking it would go very far only to find in a couple weeks that we had won that contest, Ezra and I drew our resources and flew down to BlizzCon. So we walked right up to Chris Metzen on the main floor and we introduced ourselves and seeing Chris Metzen's face light up. You guys made that movie? Return? Wow, the, when they started sending that around the company on the internal drives, everyone was watching it, everyone was talking about it and both my friend and I were just sitting there we're supposed to be geeking out on you, man. Why are you geeking out on us? Yo, yeah. And that's when the lines between fan art and real arts kind of started to blend for us, and even for them, when they started saying, hey, how would you like to come and do this kind of thing for us? And now, my title is Project Director for Cinematics. So we've got all six cutscenes uh, to review today. We can go over the Bell and the Frostwind scene, even though those were close to final last time. Your place is with our people. Most players may or may not recognize major franchise characters, you know, Thrall and Arthas and King Varian. Depending on the faction that you're on, you, know, you may or may not have ever interacted with those you know, very popular characters. But the one thing that unites all players is, is the land. The world itself is probably the key character. My favorite WoW zone has got to be Nagran. It was my favorite zone ever. So many things to kill, 12 of this, 10 of that, 8 of that. It's just like a Warcraft 12 days of Christmas. There's got to be Karazhan. Karazhan. Winter Spring. Molten Core. Ice Crown Citadel. Australia, where I was filming Superman Returns, the time when WoW first came out. And uh, we played a lot. I have fond memories of Westfall for sure, uh, and then Stormwind City. 
I remember walking through those gates and my jaw just fell to the floor. I could not believe how big the place was. And you know what, that moment has stuck with me right through to this very day. Iron Forge, I would always dance on top of the mailbox. Gilneas. Frozen Throne. Hellfire Peninsula for sure. Thousand Needles. This canyon of endless red rock reminds me of when I was growing up seeing these majestic rock formations. Honestly, it's got to be Ashara. It was just the feeling of the zone, the red leaves. It was just really, at the time, beautiful to look at. And I'm talking old school Ashara before Deathwing did what he did. craziest thing about this franchise is that the world itself is probably the most key character. I mean, that's crazy, right? It's very, very cool. So the powerful idea with Cataclysm was, what if we imperiled the world you know? Chris is like, I want to break everything. And I remember thinking like, dude, like what? Like, is this the end of Warcraft, right? And, you know, he's pitching the idea and everyone's kind of like got this like, really? Like, it's the game's doing really good. You want to break it? And they said, we want to have this big moment, this big event, where the players uh, log out and log back in and the world is all different. That was probably the scariest thing I ever heard. We didn't quite know the extent of our madness. And then we kind of realized, like, holy sh**, like, we're, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to even do this? My team and I sat down and we did uh, 48 hours of analysis of all of our data and tried to figure out if we could make this effect happen. And we came back with a definite maybe. <laughs> that was one of the more complicated things that we've ever done in the history of WoW. Incredibly complicated from an engineering perspective, from a patch delivery perspective. We figured out a way to deliver two versions of the world. So you're standing somewhere in Kalimdor, and you log out, and you log back in, and, and the world was destroyed. Even though it's now covered in water in a very different place than it used to be, I'll never forget my first time in there Players seem to really become so invested in the time that they've spent and, and what it means to them and their, the friendships they've made. It was interesting to watch the emotional waves of people engaging with the content, but really it's, it's always that way. You know, all, all of these expansion sets, all of these games. I think with any product like this, both the creators and the players mature and grow together. And you see that in the kinds of stories that they like to tell to one another. When he was three years old, I put him on WoW and he played an Undead, remember that? Yeah, I got to level, uh, I think, 10 or 11. And his favorite part was making the campfire, remember that? Yeah, I don't remember how to make the campfire. I, we have to go back and figure it out. What's what's your favorite part, Connor, about playing the Warlock? Summoning demons. So, that's good, that's what I need to teach my son. Our whole family plays, except for my five-year-old daughter. We haven't let her summon demons yet. We're, we're waiting on that one. So, thanks so much, guys. We might do that tomorrow. Tomorrow. I think with Mist of Pandaria, they were taking a slightly different approach where it wasn't just about defeating one big bad guy, it was about really exploring a whole new culture. The Asian themes, very different. The storytelling was much more philosophical. Why do we fight? For my kind, the true question is, what? is worth fighting for. And maybe that reflected the fact that the people who make these games and playing them were frankly getting older and more mature themselves. And maybe there's a little bit more sophisticated kind of storytelling that you can engage in as a person and as a player. I was heavy into the martial art movies of uh, China, Japan. My daughter was born, so I made sort of an Asian-inspired panda. So there's a little kid, there's me, big fat guy on the hill. <laughs> People really started enjoying these guys, and eventually they ended up becoming a race for Warcraft, and is actually just a, a Christmas picture to start with. I think I might have printed out the picture and gave it to someone. They're like, oh, this would be like just a cool race to do for Warcraft. And we're like, 
nah, it seems kind of kind of weird for Warcraft. And they go, well, we have an April Fool coming up. Let's let's make this an April Fool thing. So we put a little bit of history to them, added some more pictures, and April Fools, the new race in, in Warcraft 3, the Pandaren. And everyone's like, oh, that's so cool. This is great. This is going to be so awesome. And we're like, oh, they actually like it. What do we do now? Miss of Pandaria, I think, is um, shows how much we can continue to drive the visual look of our expansions. What's really been awesome is just seeing what like, Chris Robinson, who's the art director, and what that art team is able to accomplish when they're just given the time to craft, you know, art. Everything has to be about the idea. So what we try to support around here is don't focus on finish, don't focus on rendering perfectly and making sure that every pixel is in the right place. Focus on this first part and make sure that if the idea is amazing and the structure and the foundation is amazing, we'll get to the rendering part. As a technical director, it's a lot of collaboration with the art team. When we were thinking actually for doing the Pandaren for Mr. Pandaria, they wanted to make a character that is um, much more alive and is able to emote better, which required like facial animation type of technology. We actually had to build kind of custom technology to make sure that the, the actual face shape can change. With the technology that you provide, you, you tend to kind of give artists and designers the tools that they can use to bring the world to life. Um, so Engine kind of tries to enable creative people to do very creative things. Our bond is iron. Our will unbreakable. Who will stand against us? Every new expansion, we are trying to push our storyline forward. We're trying to offer new types of gameplay experiences that you've never been able to have before. You know, in Warlords of Draenor, we're saying, hey, you wanted to build a base in the world, maybe? You, your interest in Blizzard franchises harkens all the way back 20 years ago. Well, now you can have a little bit of that flavor in, in your World of Warcraft also. Wouldn't it be cool if we went back to Draenor before it was Outland? What if we were able to encounter these warlords that we've heard about in Warcraft 1 and Warcraft 2 and these stories in Warcraft 3, but have never actually played with in World of Warcraft? One of the things I really love about Warlords of Draenor is that it, it gives us the chance to kind of go back to a, a place and an era in the history of the world that no one's seen. And what comes with that is, you know, all the super nerdy, you know, kind of layerings of like, well, you're going to break the timeline. We can't go back in the past. It's like Marty and Doc and the time machine. We're going to break it all and my parents are never going to meet. And what are you doing to the space-time continuity? We had to think through all the fiction and we had to think through all the, the consequence of um, what happens if we screw it all up. So today's the day that we open up our first couple of raid bosses for testing on the beta servers. One thing that I think is really a hallmark of World of Warcraft betas is that really players are getting a chance to be invited into the creative process and to see things while they're not really finished. Well, Midwinter has 10 people here, so that's, that's enough to test. For something like what we're doing right now, where we have a brand new expansion, Warlords of Draenor, it's a closed beta test where we send out waves of invites. The two designers that are up at bat today are Jason, who made the butcher fight that's in High Mall, and Candace, who worked on Gruel in Blackrock Foundry. Is this pretty much what you're expecting yeah. in terms of their positioning? And the first step is we put a raid boss up for testing, but we also open a thread for feedback. It's just too much for three, I think. Yeah, I guess we'll see. We actually often err on the side of making things a little bit harder because when something is tuned to be more difficult than we ultimately want it to be, we can then at least see how far people make it. When something's too easy, they just go in and win, and we don't know how much harder we need to make it to actually get it to the right place. Around me, what the mechanic is? It's you. I thought you thought you want your range to soak it because yeah. they're because your melee are usually soaking is other thing that has the stack. Exactly. Okay. So they're just doing it wrong. Yeah. Basically. Okay. I think he knocks everybody away. So they're just running back in. Here they go. Five bucks that wiped to overwhelming blows again. Everyone seems to be wiping to overwhelming blows. Oh, oh, and tanks down. That took six seconds. Well, you're supposed to split the damage from that ability, and I don't think they know that yet. We get to watch a fraction of players that are actually testing the encounter with our own eyes. 
but then we get to read what hundreds if not thousands of people are saying about it and sharing their experiences, what they found frustrating, what they found hard to read, hard to interpret. Jason, there's actually some genuine feedback posts with a couple of links on okay. the US form. Okay. Um, if you go look at the EU feedback thread, you'll see some, some things, but not necessarily feedback. <laughs> Usually, the consensus from the feedback is, is pretty accurate and really serves well to inform us in the overall direction of the fight. We use that to craft and to tailor the experience and to improve it in a way that's going to make for a better experience for them when the game goes live. Our ends, like ray testing continues, started mythic testing this week. Um, the big thing I'm working on personally is fixing our dungeon tuning. Uh, Thank you. We've kind of left it for a while. Like, our dungeons, I know, are ridiculously too hard okay. across the board. Our normals had been about where heroics should be, and heroics were about where challenge should be, and challenge was probably literally impossible. Basically, I feel like game designers are deviant psychologists. Like, we're trying to manipulate your emotions and motivate you to do things, but not for some higher calling, just so you have a good time and have fun. We also just made a change for bonus roll tokens, which you guys should be aware of. If you do gold, you can do gold for 500 gold the first time. But then you can also, once you do that once, you can it escalates and you can do this. You can get a oh, second cool. one for a yes. thousand gold or a third one for two thousand gold. We're just moving back to gold, which is the original universal currency. Right. Like it's this currency that you get from doing anything in the game. Or and so about like inflation. Inflation, inflation, yeah. yeah. No. People often ask us, well, did you hire an economist to figure this out for you? And and we really didn't. I mean, what we did is we, we kind of said that, well, if there's stuff that people want and a currency that has value because you're, it, it has guaranteed value because of what you can buy from the game with it, and that currency is tradable, we'll have an economy. And sure enough, it kind of works like that. I just can't help but think of it as this giant equation and, and, and or this panel of knobs and dials, and you just turn one a little bit and it has this butterfly effect throughout the entire world, and you could screw up an entire economy for millions of, a virtual economy for millions of people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated task. That's why I work on the art team. <laughs> This has been a huge expansion, just physically in terms of the amount of world space that, is, that kind of exists. It's huge in terms of the garrison's feature and the amount of technology that has kind of had, had to be invented in order to kind of deliver that. Which one are you going to show? Well, I've got a, a few layouts that we could take a look at. Here are our large, our large plots. <laughs> Uh, here's our medium plots. We've been getting a lot of feedback that a lot of these garrison layouts are pretty sprawling, so yeah. we might be cutting back on, on some of that stuff okay. as well. Yeah. The designers came to us with the idea to create these garrisons, both human alliance and a horde orc garrisons. And the designers, you know, came to us with the pitch that, look, we already have all these things that we can, we can reuse, so we won't be as much of an impact. And um, what would you say, Rhett? How many, how many buildings have we done? 120 buildings later. As soon as you come in your front gate, you know, we want you to really resonate with, with this. We want to integrate the garrison into the questing experience. We want to make it a part of the story. We want it to be important. We want it to matter. We're trying to create a world that feels different than what you kind of see in everyday life. It is handcrafted, and I think that's what helps make WoW so special. I am so proud of Warlords of Draenor. The game looks amazing. It's so polished. You look at vanilla, you're like, oh, I wish I could, I wish I could just redo all of that stuff because of all the things we've learned, all of the techniques we can now do that we couldn't, uh, couldn't do then, you know? That's the part I really like, is the pushing. Keep pushing the tech, keep pushing the look. The people who make World of Warcraft pour so much of themselves into the game. They're trying to create games that they want to play. Even though we've grown, the thing that's always remained is that feeling of, of tribe and that feeling of creative, crackling energy. I've done this work my whole you know, adult life, and what, a, what an impossible blessing it, it has been. I was 19 when I walked in the door. It's family. I've basically known those guys since they were kids. Their personalities remain unchanged through all of it because they haven't let their egos get out ahead of them. We want to create amazing artwork or content or music or stories or quests. And to think that this game affected people is awesome and, and humbling. Give her all applause, even if you're in the alliance. We earnestly believe we're making something special. I don't think we'll ever stop 
pushing the boundaries of what we want to do and what we think is cool. As long as people play it, we always want to support this game. We never see a horizon. There's really not a precedent that we can look to. I think that we're charting new territory. There's no end to the experience. That's kind of one of the beautiful things about it. The players have never really ever finished playing World of Warcraft. The phenomenon that people probably wanted to be a part of J.R.R. Tolkien's universe found themselves able to experience it in World of Warcraft. That, I think, is going to pervade through the world as far as, like, I don't just want to watch it anymore. I want to be a part of it. I want to have impact. All the ideas and the love and everything that we had to give it, we gave it, and, and it was all about, will they like it? Will they come and play with us? It's goofy stories at the end of the day, but it always struck me as we share them, when we share them, it becomes infinitely bigger. Hi, I'm Christopher Guest. I'm the dad, uh, Tom Guest's dad. I'm Tom Guest. My favorite part about rolling a warlock is uh, that you can uh, probably one-shot someone with your Chaos Bolt, even if you're in PvP. Tom is the real player in the family, although my wife, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, has played. Um, I'm not really a player because I can't get the whole up, down, left, right part, you know, where you're moving people. I need people to, like, stop and freeze before I kill them. But I'm a big supporter. I think it's a great game. I'm really a proud mom of a WoW player. Go Horde. <laughs> the aspects that keep me coming back to World of Warcraft is all the magic training I'm receiving for when I become a real magician and learn how to stamp my enemies out and crush them like dirt under my boot. The social interaction and that feeling of communal spirit. We're sitting on 10 years of World of Warcraft now, 20 years of Warcraft lore altogether, and we still cannot cook our own bacon. We need to cook our own bacon. The funniest reaction I've ever gotten when I told someone I played World of Warcraft was, you're a girl. Jerks. I'm here working late uh, a lot, and my wife, I, I miss her, and we're, uh, so I take a little time out and I have my tauren and she has hers and I just meet her by a lake at sunset and we'll just go fishing and watch the sunset. And like to me, like that feels like we're there, you know, like for a few minutes, I can share that moment with her. The one thing I really want to see in World of Warcraft is a unicorn. I don't care if it doesn't exist in Azeroth right now, but come on, we need unicorns with like flying rainbow tails. Think of Nian Cat. We need like Nian corn, right? Right? The things on my wish list for World of Warcraft's content updates would be to explore the continent in southern Draenor where the ogres are native to. You have dragons, you have everything else, but you have no unicorns. You need unicorns. To see the islands in the Great Sea, like Xandalar and Cult Tyrus. Unicorns. Murderous unicorns, flying unicorns, unicorns I can ride. Or to revisit Ajol Narub, as it wasn't really explored that well in Wrath of the Lich King. I do have to admit that I have a secret, kind of shameful wish for WoW's future. Unicorns. Lots and lots of unicorns. In the outside world, I'm a simple geologist. But in here, I am Falcorn, defender of the Alliance. I've braved the Fargo Deep Mine, defeated the Bloodfish at Jared's Landing. Oh. Hmm. Looks like that guy just killed you. What? Why?
If this documentary sucks, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs>